just, just keep praying for him. Um, you know, today is uh, February 19th. Um, and so the question that I have for us today is, um, what kind of legacy are we, did we receive? And what kind of legacy are we going to be leaving to the next generation? So February 19th is an important date in my family's history. It's the, uh, the day that my grandfather was born, Ray Charles Witter, born in February 19th, 1896, which is now 127 years ago today. He was my father's mother, and now my little grandson, Lewin, looks a lot like him, as you, as you can see. I only knew Grandpa from his later years, um, because he had profound memory loss. But because of that, he was able to repeat his poems and stories of his glory days. You know, that may have been, you know, God's way of preserving history. He'd speak of uh, playing professional football uh, in the National Football League for the Rochester Jeffersons, and he played against Hall of Famer Jim Thorpe, and tackled him a few times. He was also a catcher in semi-pro baseball for many years, and he shared how his team had struck out Babe Ruth on several occasions. Although I think Babe Ruth probably popped a few home runs in between. In fact, my grandmother's name was Ruth. And it was also, the, uh, she was uh, one of the elders in the local Presbyterian church, uh, very attentive toward him in his later years. He served in the U.S. Navy during World War, both World Wars, actually, World War I and II. Uh, he was a commander. He was also a high school principal, uh, and later a writer and editor for the Veterans Administration. He seemed to be stuck on these glory stories. Um, never really said much about God, actually. I'm not sure he even knew my name, but he always recited this prayer at the head of the table during dinner time. Dear Lord, bless this food to our use and our lives to thy loving serveness. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Well, Grandpa Witter here was 10th generation from early American settlers through his father's line, and making me 12th generation and making my grandson Lewin 14th generation Americans. Well, the first generation in America was William Witter. He was born in England in 1584. He was part of the Puritan movement and traveled the arduous journey overseas with his son Josiah and daughter Hannah to settle in Swampskit near Lynn, Massachusetts around 1639 to escape religious persecution. William Witter had some deep convictions. He had become an early Baptist, prosecuted and reviled for rejecting infant baptism by the religious establishment in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So in one generation, the Puritan persecuted had become the persecutors. In his old age, in the summer of 1651, he called the pastor of Newport Baptist Church, a Dr. John Clark, that he might, quote, hear the word of God and be baptized. The pastor of two other men who had been exiled for their beliefs, for their, for their beliefs in believers' baptism took a risk and traveled to Lynn to see my ancestor and minister to him and others who started gathering at his home for a revival of sorts. They were all arrested, and one of them, Obadiah Holmes, was beaten severely, which induced a movement back in England to initiate reforms for religious liberty. So even in his later years, William was a courageous activist for the cause of revival in early America and for religious freedom. Now, William's daughter, Hannah, with her husband, Edmund Chamberlain, settled in Roxbury, Massachusetts, where John Eliot, the apostle to the Indians, lived and translated the Bible into the Massachusetts language for emerging communities of praying Indians. Well, they moved, Hannah and her husband, Edmund, moved uh, to New Roxbury, which is Woodstock, where we are to this day, this very town, which was one of the 14 uh, towns of the praying Indians overseen by Eliot. This is where he had preached to the Nipmunks over here on Pulpit Rock Road. And why Eliot's picture is on our town logo. 
So Hannah and Edmund were early settlers around here at that time, around the time of uh, John Eliot. And Edmund actually was a deacon of the First Congregational Church right over here. Hannah was in fact buried in the cemetery in 1696. Of course, we didn't find this out until we read the Witter genealogy that, that, that uh, And um, now William's son uh, moved to Preston, Connecticut, where he begat Ebenezer Witter. Of course, you have to say begat when you use the name Ebenezer, right? <laughs> Who founded the first congregational church as a deacon and a devout Christian. But he died at the age of 44 of pneumonia in 1712. And to this day, his headstone exists just 40 miles south of here. So life in those colonial days was tenuous. And his epitaph, if you, if you can read through the, the lichen on the surface, it says, seek for the kingdom of heaven, deal justly, love mercy, walk humbly. And of course, he's quoting Micah 3.8. And it turns out there are winter cemeteries scattered throughout the last green valley here with similar epitaphs. Of course, this is not a typo, by the way. That's how they spelled seek in those days. Um, Ebenezer's grandson was Captain Ebenezer Witter, who served with his son, Ebenezer Witter. Actually, there's six Ebenezer Witters in my genealogy. So Ebenezer and Ebenezer served in the Revolutionary War under uh, Colonel Selden's Connecticut Regiment, fighting for freedom of perceived tyranny and oppression back in the day. Now, 100 years later, um, my grandfather's father, Volney Spalding Witter, fought for a more perfect union as well in the end of slavery in these United States in the Civil War under the Army of the Potomac. But I cannot rest on the value added of this Christian heritage or these just causes. Um, I'm sure they were far from perfect. In fact, I know they were imperfect. But they had many noble intentions and were driven by the purposes of the kingdom of God, which is not a small thing. So every generation, including our own, has the choice to live on a legacy or to tear it down, to disown it or to embrace it, to dismantle it or to redeem it. Well, in 2007, during seminary, I did a life map uh, and when I did the life map, I realized that some of my ancestors on the Witter's side, the same side that I'm talking about, were also part of the modern missionary movement. And uh, that was launched here from New England uh, after the Third Great Awakening in the 19th century. Uh, it's an awakening which gave rise to abolition movement and social activism. And in my research, I found that my grandfather's uncle, this guy, they had photography by then. <laughs> um, uh, the, his, his name was Reverend William Witter, and he, his namesake after my great-great ancestor, um, that he was a missionary naturopathic physician uh, to Assam, India, uh, with the American Baptist Mission, and subsequently a mission mobilizer in America. In his obituary, which I found in 1931, written by J.A. Curtis, one of his mentees, he speaks of, of William Witter as, as having a precious gift of deep spiritual influence, of having teaching and literary gifting, denying himself, and um, having a precious gift of steep, deep spiritual influence, having teaching and literary gifting, denying himself, having a strong capacity for love and abiding friendship, and being an outstanding advocate for the missions among the American churches. In his later years, he returned to India to finish well on mission and actually died in India. William Witter's son, Ted Witter, himself a missionary to Turkish Muslims, used to visit my grandparents' hosts when my mother was just a wee lass. And he, she remembers, she tells me she remembers him getting up early in the morning and praying. And she would ask him, what are you doing? Well, I'm praying for India and I'm praying for you, Mary, and your children who come after you. So the fruit of these early morning prayers, I believe, is, is in continuation of the legacy of 10 preceding generations. Um, and that's why I think my mother ultimately did not drop the torch of faith. 
in the living God and on his mission. Nor did she cease to pray for me, even in my wayward years. As an artist, she is u- utilizing her later years to travel, paint, and display the glories of God in Bible stories, human stories, and nature. She used the opportunity uh, to be featured in this past December in a gallery in Rhinebeck, New York, uh, to witness to the wonders of the eager embrace of the father of the prodigal son, the poise of Rebecca awaiting Isaac, uh, the feeding of the 5,000, which you can see up here, and the crucifixion. Uh, The painting in the lower right-hand corner is of a refugee raising a cross, uh, and in a little pamphlet that she handed out for uh, people to see when they come visit the uh, exhibition, she writes, she believed, that is, this refugee believed that he would never leave her or forsake her and would give her strength and peace in the midst of suffering. He made many promises, and he has never gone back on his promises. Amen? So never underestimate, brothers and sisters, the power of, the next, uh, of prayer for the next generation. Prayer is a transformative legacy that we can leave. Even if our bodies are failing, we can pray sincerely. Amen? Even to the ends of the earth. And this inheritance is extended to all the nations. So open up uh, your Bibles to Psalm 61 that uh, Pastor Dave read for us. This psalm is a psalm of David, King David. Uh, He wrote it uh, about for stringed instruments. Um, The context of him uh, is that he was king at this time, but he also was fleeing, had been fleeing from his son Absalom's rebellion. Um, who was seeking to kill David and take the throne from him. So he had left Jerusalem and uh, really had to trust in the Lord to restore his promises to him. So verse 1, Hear my prayer, O God, listen to my prayer. Prayer begets a confidence in God to listen and to act. And we know that if he worked in the patriarch's lives through the generations and works in the people of Israel, then maybe, just maybe, he is at work in my generation, my ancestors, and in, in still working in my generation. So Lord, give us eyes to see you moving in us, and give us courage to pray, we pray. In verse 2, David writes, From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Now, David, at this time, may have felt far from God at this point in his life, fleeing from the threats of his own beloved son, Absalom, who basically had gone off the deep end. Or if he could have been, he could have felt far far from his rightful throne in the city of Jerusalem, which is the city on a hill. But there are also people calling from the ends of the earth today, like these Tamachek and Fulani people, um, whose hearts are faint with fear and turmoil, looking for a higher ground, for the rock of ages in whom they can put their trust. In verse 3, David says, For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. Don't we all need a refuge from the storms of life? A safe place, a sacred ground? Many were the perils in colonial life in my ancestors the diseases they had to resist, the the hard soil they had to till, the passions they had to tame, and the wars fought for freedom and from oppression and justice. Congregations were sacred spaces. And we know that if we make anything or anyone our refuge, we make ourselves vulnerable to the enemies, uh, to, to the enemy of our soul. So there are many oppositions to the spread of the gospel on the frontiers of mission, and we heard about some of them today. But Lord, Lord, we pray that you would become a refuge for them. In verse 4, David writes, I long to dwell in your tent forever and to take refuge in the shelter of your wings. Selah. Now nobody nobody knows what Selah means. Um, But it probably means pause and reflect about this. So let's pause for a moment.
David may have had in mind in the tabernacle in Jerusalem here when he said, I want to dwell in your tent forever. He may have had in mind about the shelter of his wings, the, the seraphim wings covering the Ark of the Covenant. But you can see also in this, in this verse, there's a, there's a relational element. So to be in a tent is to be home with God, how, wherever, wherever he is. And he invites all who will respond to the invitation. Even if your ancestors did not dwell in the tents of the Almighty, even first generation children of God can find refuge in his wings. Malachi 4.2 writes, uh, he writes, but you who revere my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. The same word for wings, chanaf in, in Hebrew, uh, was used also to describe the edge of garments. So when Jesus came and healed and they touched the hem of his garment, it was a sign that he was Messiah to come to heal the nations, to dwell with us, and to pitch his tent with us, his tabernacle with us. He was Emmanuel, God with us, to make us whole. In verse 5, David says, For you, God, have heard my vows. You have given me the inheritance, the heritage of those who fear your name. Now, David made vows to God. He was, after all, a man of his own heart. But he also broke a lot of promises and made some mistakes, like we all do, and he suffered for it. The heritage given and recognized to David was that he was of the line of Seth. He was Noah of Abraham and of Isaac and Jacob and Judah. He was a person of promise. And we too have a heritage and a precedent if in general in the Western world, though it may be littered with imperfection and punctuated by needs of revival uh, for social justice movements and for a return to the living and active word of God for each generation. Just like the storyline of the Bible. So the question is, what will we do now with what we've been given? David continues, increase the days of the king's life for his many generations. Now, this was a prayer and a petition of David to preserve his life and influence for good, as God had already promised him a throne after the painful challenge of his son Absalom's rebellion. And now here in this verse, there is an appeal to God to preserve faithfulness uh, through the generations, no matter what hardships are which are coming our way. And it was a prayer to bless and preserve those who go after us. In verse 7, David continues, May he be enthroned in God's presence forever. Appoint your love and faithfulness to protect him. Now David here may be speaking or singing, if you will, uh, about the righteous king that was promised and would come through his own lineage. An eternal king, as he says, enthroned in God's presence forever. But also you can see that it's the, of the preservation of faithfulness through the succeeding generations, which he call, he's asking for. And it is through love and faithfulness that this will be accomplished. Not by power, not by might, not by money, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And each generation has to choose. David continues in verse 8, Then... I will sing in praise of your name and fulfill my vows day after day. So when a generation is found faithful, when love is manifest for both God and for people, then praise erupts, amen, knowing that it all comes from God. And this empowers action. It causes justice to roll like many waters. It leads to revival and renewal day after day, in a thousand places, here and to the ends of the earth. Amen? So an interesting phenomenon happened this, this past week and a half, um, past 11 days. <laughs> I don't know if you heard about it. Asbury College, uh, Kentucky, a typical chapel service was occurring midweek, February 8th. 
in an unassuming message uh, that was delivered by uh, Zach Mirkiribs, uh, was shared, he shared it to the student body, and uh, he spoke simply on Romans 12, uh, 9 through 21. This was about the love of God and how uh, we're called to perfect love in our li lifetimes. And it was a challenge to the students to, to, to love others. And once the love of God is experienced, he says, it must be poured out to a hurting world. And after this chapel service, it usually ends and the students go back to their classrooms. Uh, but they stayed, and they stayed, and they stayed. They stayed all night. And they, more people came the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And the student got viral on social media. People are coming from many nations to see what's going on here in Asbury. And you know, time will test the fruit of this movement, if it is a movement at all, which, will, which has garnered you know, national and international attention. But it's interesting is Asbury was a place uh, that saw movements of the spirit and some revivals throughout the, Europe, the, the years. And it has had measurable impact on the church growth in the United States and around the world, the missionary mobilization and other things. And there was also a revival in 1970 which produced pastors and missionaries and activists uh, that were scattered throughout the world. So keep your eyes on this. And pray, pray for revival in our own midst. You know, God doesn't just exist in one location. He says, not on this mountain or on Jerusalem will God be worshipped, but in spirit and in truth, right? Amen? Amen. And it's in, the quiet, it's in the quietness of our own devotion and in our, our faithfulness and our love uh, with each other and among the everyday warp and woof of life that really is, is where God is at work. Well, Maria and I lived in Southern California in the 1990s, not 70s. I was a wee little lad in the 1970s. But we attended a Calvary Chapel, um, and this is the blossoming fruit of the Jesus movement in the early 1970s, Pastor Chuck Smith. And, and this is showcased in a new movie that's coming out this week uh, in theaters called The Jesus Revolution. So here, they, this church emphasized uh, the word of God in the context of a troubled and emerging hippie culture. And, it, and, and this church contextualized the gospel to, um, uh, and led to this amazing movement of God uh, now scattered throughout the world. There's about 1,600 uh, similar Calvary Chapel type uh, churches um, spread throughout the country and the world. So every generation, broken as they can be, they may be, and they are, can be like Abraham, blessed to be a blessing to the nations. But this takes commitment, and it, it takes keeping our end of the covenant. Amen? But what's our re responsibility? David says, and fulfill my vows day after day. That was his prayer. So, we have to start with being redeemed ourselves. We have to start with feeling the love of God. Uh, like uh, Zach said in, uh, uh, in Asbury. So are, are we included in this legacy simply by birth, by genetics, or by cultural Christianity, just because we're Americans? Can we lay claim to this inheritance but of what our ancestors have done and labored for by showing up at church? I don't think so. It takes a radical shift. The Apostle Paul explains how we can be, all become part of this irrevocable blessing and inheritance that God gave and that every generation must choose to follow Jesus. No matter what our family background or our financial status or race or, or any gender or anything else, no matter how broken or empty or stodgy the legacy handed down to us is, we have a responsibility. Paul wrote to the Ephesians in, in chapter 1, verse 13 through 14. He writes, um, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance, ours, brothers and sisters, until the redemption of those who are God's possession, full redemption, to the praise of his glory. 
Thanks be to God. This is an indescribable gift of adoption and inheritance. I hope we realize that. Peter also wrote to the first generation Gentile believers in 1 Peter 1, 13 through 23. For I know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but to be revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him so that your faith and hope are in God. And he goes on about faith being followed by being uh, formed by the word of God. Be formed by the word of God. Verse 22, he continues, Now that you have been purified by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply. So the call, you cannot automatically expect love to, uh, to be brought to your life. You have to pray to God to give you the love, to love one another deeply from the heart, he says. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. He continues, for all people are like grass and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Amen? Amen. So there is indeed a rock that is higher than my biology. My ancestor, Ebenezer Witter, his bones are probably dust by now, but the word of God is inscribed on his rock in Preston. And may it be inscribed in our hearts. Some have taken advantage of the heritage of covenant faithfulness in their lineage, which is a solid rock foundation upon which uh, we can all build. In the second letter to Timothy, uh, chapter 1, verse 5 through 7, Paul speaks about a legacy through his mother's line. Like my mother's. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So even Timothy couldn't rest upon his parents' faith. Uh, even with that background, Timothy still needed revival. He needed the Holy Spirit in his life. For the Spirit of God, he writes, does not give us a spirit of timidity, but of power and of love and of self-discipline. And that changes the world, brothers and sisters. So we sing, we sing of his love, and we love others because he first loved us. So we can start singing about it like the praise team did here. It was great to have Kaylin back with us. Amen. Your voice is still as good as ever. <laughs> um, so the Psalm 89, 1 through 4, uh, the psalmist writes, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn, David, my servant, I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. This was the promise that David was holding on to. And that, that psalm said, uh, has another selah, selah. Let's pause for a moment and think about that. So we must, like David, sing of his faithfulness and then be found faithful. As the bride in the wedding maskal sings of the royal groom in Psalm 45, 17, which is a beautiful picture of, of, of the task of the church. I will sing, I'm, I'm sorry, I will perpetuate your memory throughout all generations. Therefore, the nations will praise you forever and ever. So we need to let him reign. He needs the king, after all. So this indescribable gift of grace can be spurned. It can be, its embers can be snuffed out in one generation. It's tenuous. 
in our Bible survey series, uh, we will soon see what happened to David's royal descendants. It's really a series of travesties punctuated by uh, moments of uh, revivals. But God's faithfulness persists. Amen. And to be true to his promises, uh, which led to the arrival of the eternal righteous King Jesus. The Apostle Paul wrote, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentiles, Romans 1, 6. But he realized that likewise Jesus himself is not ashamed of us, brothers and sisters. Hebrews 2, 11. Even if we cannot claim to be descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or if we just arrived you know, onto the scene without much of a legacy, broken at the hospital entrance, desperate for healing. If he is not ashamed of us, we should not be ashamed of him. And deeply grateful for being grafted into the olive root and beginning to be healed of our own brokenness, from ashes to beauty, to become oaks of righteousness for his namesake. So we are royal priests. So whether this gift is given to us, this legacy of love through our ancestors, or if we receive it anew uh, from an empty way of life, or we, we have to make a choice. And we have to, if, if, and friends, if you, if, if you have not received this legacy of the people of God, haven't received it as a gift, it's freely available. Amazing as that sounds, if you would simply reach out in faith, even today. But once received, what then shall we do with this legacy? How can it be made stronger by the grace of God? All sons and daughters of the Most High, we are part of the royal priesthood of all believers. And that's a significant thing. Uh, newly adopted in the family or in the family for a long time, Peter writes in his first letter, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to a higher purpose. We are redeemed, brothers and sisters, for a reason. He goes on, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. To whom do we declare his praises? To the next generation. To be influencers for God and for good. There are things from our past, uh, or our parents' past, or, or their parents' past. You could go up 14 generations. Every generation is, has honorable and dishonorable thoughts and actions. But we each have a responsibility to make good on the promises of God and trust in his abiding purposes, amen? And to, be, and to become positive change agents in the world. You know, in the Lord of the Rings, uh, Gandalf, uh, counsels Frodo to continue in his troubled but noble quest. He says, all we have to decide is what to do with the time that we have been given. From those of us with a legacy of love and Christian faith, we have a heightened responsibility. Jesus said, from everyone who has been given much, much more will be demanded. And from, from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be required. So we need to reach even higher ground than our ancestors, than our parents. So whether we're new to the tent of God or following a caravan of faithfulness throughout the generations, what we will do with this legacy matters. Paul wrote to the Philippians about putting no confidence in the flesh. So we can't rest on our pedigree or our good works or the faith of our ancestors or the, or the Christian influence of our country, we can, forever power, can, can we forever power the planet on fossil fuels without innovation? We can't make new wineskins and throw out the good wine. We need to become a city on a hill. You know, America has a mixed history. Um, we, you know, we can't be defined by the 1619 project, by the way. My family tree and the early settlers in New England show a different reality. 
John Winthrop wrote in 1630 that England, New England was to become a city on a hill because of the Christian foundations intended for the new country. He warned in his famous speech on the ship that was heading to Boston as he was about to found the Massachusetts Bay Colony and become its, its uh, governor for many years. He said not to fall, to embrace this present world and prosecute our carnal intentions. Rather, he said, remain in covenant with God, lest this endeavor fails. And he says, we shall become a story and a byword throughout the world. He goes on. Not, uh, now the only way to avoid this shipwreck and to provide for our posterity is to follow the counsel of Micah, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. These are the very words that are inscribed on my ancestor Ebenezer Witter's tombstone in Preston. Winthrop finished his discourse quoting Moses from Deuteronomy 30 about every generation having a choice for life by serving God or for death by worshiping and serving other gods. And he says, our pleasure and our profits. And his last line is this, therefore let us choose life that we and our seed may live by obeying his voice and cleaving to him, for he is our life and our prosperity. Amen? Amen. But you can see that in 400 years, our spelling has improved. <laughs> but, uh, but public Christian culture is eroding, isn't it? And knowledge of God's word is waning. Can you see it? The place established as a city built on God's presence and promises, where John Eliot shared his gospel with nipmunks, where my ancestors worshipped, where pastors were well-trained at Harvard and Yale and Brown uh, to witness to Christ, and, and really the land where the modern missionary movement began, between Providence, uh, Boston, and New Haven, Hartford. You can add Albany in there. These are the least churched and most biblically illiterate cities in the country. according to some polls. And we're kind of right smack dab in the middle of them, aren't we? <laughs> that to me is a real existential crisis, a famine for hearing the word of the Lord. So the Rock of Ages, Paul as a Pharisee had the privilege of the Torah as God's chosen nation, yet he was ready to snuff out the followers of the living word in one generation, the Logos. The stone the builders rejected had become the capstone, and he realized that ultimately on the road to Damascus. The one who came from fresh redemption, Jesus, to heal all the nations. But Paul didn't rest on his privileges. As a matter of fact, later on he called them filthy rags, that he may gain Christ and be found in him. So he built it upon, uh, but yet he built, he built uh, an amazing missionary movement uh, with his back, the Jewish background and his, his understanding of the Torah to change the course of the Western world. Do we realize that? And we are the beneficiaries. So we must press on, brothers and sisters, no matter what heritage is given to us. Paul urges in uh, Philippians 3, 13 through 14, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So whether we rest on these good aspects or heritage or are beset by and need to reform the troubled parts of it, we must press on toward the upward call of God, toward the rock that is higher than each of us and to lead others, our neighbors and the nations to the rock of our salvation. Let's pray. Sovereign Lord, maker of heaven and earth, hear our prayer, we cry to you. Lead us, Father, to the rock that is higher than I. Lead us to the highest places to improve upon our faithfulness, our justice, and, and our love of, for prior, of prior generations. Help us to build upon that, or, or even to start fresh as you break generational cycles of impairment for those who would now confess you as Lord and Savior. 
We pray also, Lord, for John, that you would guide and direct um, his treatments to be fully restored, we ask. Let us not shrink back, but to press on toward the upward call. Lord, lead us to the rock that is higher, to a king that is eternal. May we be unmoved by the faithfulness and inspired by the faithful, faithfulness of those who have gone before us, and to follow the seed of the promise to the patriarchs and make us among the redeemed of Israel the blessed to be the blessing to the nations in Christ Jesus, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It has been a joy to worship with all of you this morning, my family. Um, would you please stand as we close our time together? A thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that. It's who 